Hello, this is Justin Sotelo again, and in this video I will be discussing long exposure photography, and more specifically how it pertains to landscape photography. Okay, so a couple of examples here. In this first one on the title slide, uh, you'll see that this shot was taken over 20 seconds, uh, and over 20 seconds I'm able to capture this, uh, this movement of the water in the foreground, kind of the waves crashing up against the rocks, um, as well as the movement of the clouds in the sky. Okay. Um, another example here, this one had a 27 second shutter speed. Um, I'm set up on a tripod uh, in order to keep um, elements in the scene uh, sharp uh, while at the same time capturing the, the motion of the clouds in the sky. Okay. So what is long exposure photography? As the name suggests, um, it's a style that involves utilizing slow shutter speeds. Um, we're essentially capturing a single image over an extended period of time. And as I mentioned, we're able to blur elements in the scene, such as water, waves, clouds, fog, trees, etc. Um, and this is a technique that's commonly used uh, by many landscape photographers, as well as architecture photographers, etc. Okay, so again, with the landscape, you know, you're able to get kind of this soft and silky looking water. You can get long and stretched out clouds. Uh, if you were perhaps doing cityscape photography, you could be capturing uh, light trails with perhaps cars kind of moving through your scene. And I'm sure many of you have seen that. Um, so again, we're, we're utilizing a shutter speed um, that is... Um, a long shutter speed okay so that could be uh you know one fifteenth of a second it could be one second it could be multiple seconds um basically enough time that's going to give us that movement within our scene uh but having the camera on the tripod is also going to allow us to have other elements in the scene that are that are sharp okay um so you, you know when you have kind of this combination of blur and sharpness um, you get kind of this nice contrast um, within your your photograph okay and as you might imagine uh, the the longer your shutter speed is the more uh, the moving subjects or elements in your scene the more they will blur okay um so again when when is it useful uh, again, when you have uh, kind of this combination of moving elements and stationary elements in your scene. Okay, so you might want to think about how uh, you would balance those elements. Okay. Um, so again, just some more examples here. Uh, you see this technique used with waterfalls, uh, perhaps, you know, waves, ocean waves kind of crashing against the shore or against rocks. Um, I showed you some examples of the clouds drifting through the sky. Um, etc. Okay. So another example here, um, and I'm just going to show you two examples. So this one, uh, this was taken in uh, Alabama Hills. Uh, this is an 8.9 second exposure compared to a 41 second exposure. Okay. So very similar uh, compositions here, but you'll see that with the shorter duration, um, I'm able to capture a little more texture in the sky as opposed to this one, okay? So I like to shoot a lot of uh, variety when it comes to long exposure photography, uh, just so I have all these options, you know, because at the moment, you know, when I'm taking the shot, um, you know, I'm just experimenting and trying to, to capture different things, okay? But I like both of these, uh, but just, just note that over a longer duration, you're gonna get more, more motion blur, okay? Uh, another example here, um, this one was a 90 second exposure. Um, and although the water was very calm to begin with, uh, just having that, you know, one and a half second or one and a, one minute, one and a half minute uh, exposure, I'm able to get this water, uh, you know, looking like glass essentially. Okay. Uh, another example here, this was taken at uh, Tanaya Lake, I believe, 30-second uh, exposure. This was taken midday, so I'm using a neutral density filter, uh, which basically reduces the amount of light that comes into the uh, camera. And I'm going to talk more about uh, filters here in just a bit. Um, and I think one last example here, this is, uh, again, taken pretty much midday or maybe late morning 
um, and a 20 second exposure, which uh, gives me this motion of the clouds. Okay. Okay, one last example here. I talked about light trails. Um, so again, this was taken at night and over six seconds. Uh, again, I'm on a tripod to keep all of these elements sharp, uh, but I'm capturing, um, I believe this was either a truck or a bus that, that drove by. So capturing these light trails kind of moving across the frame, okay? Okay, so gear, let's talk about gear. Um, obviously, um, we're gonna need a, a mirrorless or a DSLR camera with manual functions. We need to be able to manually adjust ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, okay? That's just a given. Um, also, many of your cameras probably have a bulb or time mode. Uh, that can come in uh, handy when you're trying to do or achieve a shutter speed um, over 30 seconds. Okay, so most of our cameras, um, have shutter speeds up to 30 seconds, but if you need to or want to go beyond that, you need to switch your camera over to bulb mode or time mode, okay? Um, many of the examples I showed you here, uh, I was using a wide angle lens, okay? Um, I'm not saying this is essential. You, you, can, you can do long exposure photography with any type of lens, but using a wide angle lens, um, it's going to provide you with a broader perspective um, and it's going to allow you to incorporate, uh, you know, elements in your foreground, your midground, your background, etc. cetera. Um, so I think a wide angle lens um, can come in really handy for this type of photography. When I say wide angle lens, I mean, uh, I'm talking about a focal length of 35 millimeters or shorter, okay? Um, I mentioned using a tripod. This is an essential. Um, in order to have um, elements that are not moving, in order to have them sharp or tack sharp in your scene, you absolutely need to be on a tripod, okay? Um, many of you probably have a tripod already. Um, if you don't have one, um, you know, it is an investment. It can be kind of uh, an expensive item to purchase, but it will be something that will last you a long time, okay? Um, but uh, again, I'm not gonna get into that, but you know, you need to do your research if you're in the market of, you know, buying a tripod, but make sure you, you find one that is durable, okay? Um, there are a lot of cheap, inexpensive options out there. Um, but you need to find something that's going to be dur durable, something that can withstand uh, the elements like wind. Um, but you also need to think about portability too, okay? Um, if you're gonna be hiking around a lot, you wanna make sure you're not, um, you know, carrying around this big heavy uh, tripod, okay? So just a few things to keep in mind. Um, another thing I think is uh, essential, um, or it could be optional, um, is a remote shutter release, okay? I, I would say it's, it's, it's essential, but you can get around it by utilizing your camera's uh, self-timer, okay? Um, basically what you're trying to do is not touch your camera uh, during your long exposure, okay? So you want to avoid uh, touching the camera's shutter button because even that, just that slight movement can blur uh, any, any sharp elements that, um, or any elements in your scene that should be sharp, okay? So I think this is a good investment. Um, if you don't have one um, at the moment, uh, you can, again, use your, your camera's self-timer. Many of the cameras have a two-second self-timer, uh, which is sufficient time to just kind of, you know, uh, step away uh, and take your shot while not touching your actual camera. So ND filters or neutral density filters, I mentioned this um, a bit ago. Um, think of them as sunglasses for your camera lens, okay? So they allow you to uh, control, better control or reduce essentially the amount of light that's coming into the camera, okay? Um, putting a filter on your lens, uh, like midday, uh, is going to allow you, or at any time, it's going to allow you to, to get a longer exposure, longer shutter speeds, okay? Um, and they're essentially, they're, they're going to be essential, right? If, especially if you're trying to do long exposure uh, during the day or in, in bright conditions, okay? Um, and they come in all different um, strengths or opacities, okay, so the darker the filter is, um, the slower your shutter speed will be, okay? I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, also know that there, 
there's a whole variety of neutral density filters or filters just in general okay you have the the type that just screw onto your lens you have other systems where you have um, a mount on the on the front of your lens and you maybe drop the filter into a slot um, there's all different types um, if you don't have ND filters you know you, you just want to do uh, your research here or a couple of uh, um, manufacturers uh, you could potentially look at so B and W Lee filter Hoya um, etc um, it, but also know that like with anything um, you know not all filters are the same you're gonna have your cheap ones your expensive ones um, I would definitely avoid uh, the cheaper ones uh, they tend to have a strong color cast um, they can make your images less sharp um, they could create some vi vignetting um, that sort of thing Okay, so when we're looking at ND filters, um, the, you'll see how they're um, essentially rated. Um, and you'll see commonly uh, filters that are referred to as two-stop filters, three-stop, six-stop, ten-stop filters, etc. Okay, so the, the higher the number, the stronger the filter is, or the more it's going to uh, reduce light from coming into your uh, lens or into your, your camera. Okay, um, so what do we mean by two stops, three stops, etc.? Okay, so if we were um, metering a scene and uh, our camera is calling for a 1 60th uh, of a second shutter speed, um, if we were utilizing a 10 stop filter, uh, we would need to extend our shutter speed by 10 stops. Okay, so we're slowing the shutter speed down by 10 stops. Okay, so 1 60th of a second would then become 16.7 seconds, okay, in order to get a proper exposure. Um, and of all the different strengths of filters, um, I would tend to say that the six stop and 10 stop filters uh, tend to be the more common filters that are used, okay? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go kind of step by step in in how we capture a long exposure photograph, okay? Um, if we're looking at landscape uh, photography, uh, obviously we're, we're gonna wa want to uh, know the weather conditions, okay? Um, you know, is it a overcast day? Is there, are there no clouds in the sky? Okay, those might not be the best conditions for long exposure photography if we're wanting, wanting to kind of capture uh, kind of, you know, some, some dramatic clouds kind of moving through the scene. Okay, so studying the weather, knowing the weather, uh, knowing what your conditions are gonna be uh, before you explore this type of photography. Okay, you may want to scout or visit your location in advance. Okay, so what, you know, what is it you're looking for in your scene? Are you trying to capture uh, moving water, um, waves, fog, um, you know, again, clouds moving through the scene? So, you know, study, Study your location, um, you know, visit it, um, and then kind of, you know, kind of figure out what your composition is going to be, okay? You also need to know whether or not the sun or where the sun's going to be positioned in your, you know, that day or at that scene, uh, because you're not going to want the sun kind of moving through your frame. Um, otherwise, it's going to end up being kind of this bright streak of light moving through your, your, uh, your frame. Okay, so a couple of uh, things, or I was going to refer to um, PhotoPills, uh, an app where you can basically um, check out your location and, and know exactly where the sun's going to be at any given time. Okay, so if you don't have this app, um, I believe it's about a nine or ten dollar um, app, but uh, a lot of a lot of cool tools that are built into PhotoPills. Okay. Uh, I mentioned composition. Okay, so step three, determine your composition. Okay, and like always, having a strong composition is important um, in order for you to create a compelling image. Okay, you want to think about the elements in your scene. Okay, what's moving? What's going to be stationary? And how are those elements going to be interacting with each other? Okay, knowing, you know, what your foreground's going to be, your midground, your background. Um, and again, as I mentioned, knowing those still elements versus the moving elements and how, how they're going to interact with each other, okay? Uh, so determine your, your composition and then you're gonna want to uh, put your camera on the tripod and kind of refine your composition at that point, okay? Okay, so um, 
again, I talked about, about foreground, midground, background. Okay, so you know, I thought about those elements um, as I was kind of framing uh, this shot. Okay, I knew that there were. Uh, it was kind of a windy day. Um, not too windy, not windy enough to move the camera on the tripod, but windy enough to kind of capture this movement in the foreground. And I also had clouds kind of moving through the scene. Okay, so I was thinking about how all of those elements are, are going to kind of interact with each other. Okay. Okay, step four, you're going to want to set up your gear. You know, you've already put the camera on the tripod, um, but you're going to also want to set up... Uh, your additional accessories. I mentioned using a remote shutter release if you have one. Um, and then if you're using an ND filter, uh, depending on the, the system that you have, you might want to put the, the filter holder on your lens at this time. We're not putting the filter in yet. Uh, we're going to take a test shot. Uh, but if you have a remote shutter release and you're utilizing an ND filter, um, now is the time to, to get those set up. Okay. Okay, and again, I talked about refining your composition, right? You, you have your, your camera set up on the tripod, you've got your accessories. Let's double check our composition. Um, and at this point too, we're gonna want to focus our lens, okay? Um, and with landscape photography, you generally want most of your scene in focus, okay? So what does that mean? Uh, we want as much depth of field as possible, uh, which is going to require, you know, utilizing a, a uh, an f-stop like f11, f16, that sort of thing. Um, another thing we want to think about is where we're going to focus, okay? So where, what is the, the, the kind of main point of interest in your image? Or if you want that depth of field kind of throughout, um, you may have heard the term hyperfocal distance, okay? What does that mean? It's, it means we're, we're focusing at about a third of the way into the scene, okay? And if you want to be more specific in kind of nailing the hyperfocal distance. Um, you can utilize, they have calculators. Again, I mentioned photo pills. If you go to their website, uh, they do have a calculator where you can plug in your exact camera model, uh, the type of lens that you're using, what aperture you'll be shooting at, and it will tell you, it'll, it'll calculate where you need to focus in your scene, okay? You can do that online or you can do it uh, with the app um, on your phone as well. Okay, but generally speaking, um, a lot of people say, you know, focusing about a third of the way in, into the scene will give you, um, you know, that nice kind of depth of field that you're looking for. But it, again, if you want to be more specific, uh, check out photo pills. Um, once you have set your focus and you have that locked in, you then want to switch your lens over to manual focus, okay? And the reason for that is you do not want to um, accidentally hit your shutter button again and, and throw off the focus, okay? So you can utilize your autofocus system, um, lock your focus, get that nailed down. And then once that's nailed down, you've got your composition, you've got your, your focus, switch your lens over to manual mode so you don't accidentally refocus, okay? And here's just a, a screenshot of what the PhotoPills app looks like um, if you're trying to calculate that hyperfocal distance here, okay? Um, a couple of other suggestions. Uh, because we're on a tripod, um, we don't need to have image stabilization enabled. Uh, so if you have that on, on your lens or in your camera body, um, you might, or I would suggest disabling those, okay? Um, because we already have the tripod that's stabilizing our shot, okay? So what might hap happen is, uh, you know, you have these moving elements in your lens or in your camera, and they might try to work um, and, and actually do the opposite of what you want. They might actually create movement um, in your camera or in your lens and thus, you know, giving you a potentially a, a blurry shot, okay? So I would disable image stabilization. Um, another thing, I think by default, your, your camera's, um, if, you're if your camera does have long exposure noise reduction, um, I would just make sure that that too is disabled. Um, you know, over a long shutter speed, uh, your camera could potentially uh, create noise within the image, but um, when you do have this enabled, basically it, uh, it takes your camera a longer period of time to, to process that image, okay? 
Um, so I would turn that off because you want more time in the field, right? You want more time shooting. Um, and when that um, feature is enabled, it's taking your camera longer to process the image and which is resulting in you taking less photographs, okay? Um, so noise can always be fixed in post-processing. Um, so again, two suggestions. I would disable image stabilization and make sure that your long exposure noise reduction is turned off as well. Um, but again, once the camera comes off the tripod and you're doing other types of photography, um, I would go ahead and, and, and uh, turn, turn image stabilization back on. Okay, so a couple of examples of what that looks like. This is saying the stabilizer is on. We want to make sure it's off when we're on the tripod. And then just a screenshot here of your menus. Um, make sure that your long exposure noise reduction is off or disabled. Okay, step seven, now we're going to set our exposure. Okay, so you could either be in manual exposure mode or aperture priority mode. Um, we'll want to choose an ISO that has a low value or your camera's lowest native ISO, which could be ISO 50 or 100 or 200, okay? We want a better quality image, okay? And we're going to be on a tripod um, with a long shutter speed so we can uh, utilize a low ISO. Um, and again, with landscape photography, um, you know, I would suggest uh, an aperture like f8, f11, or f16. Those are generally um, going to be kind of the, the better apertures to use to get as much depth of field as possible um, and to also get the sharpest image possible, okay? Um, and then we're going to select a shutter speed based on what our uh, camera's metering system tells us, okay? So we're locking in our ISO, we're locking in our um, aperture, and then we're gonna see what type of shutter speed our camera calls for, okay? Unless you're in aperture priority mode, then your camera will automatically determine uh, the shutter speed, okay? But we wanna take note of what that shutter speed is, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna take a test shot. Uh, take a test shot, we've already nailed our composition, we've already nailed our focus, we've nailed our exposure. Um, now take the test shot and then we're going to review that image and make sure the exposure looks good. Okay, make sure that the focus is where it needs to be. Okay, but again, taking note of what that original shutter speed was. Okay, so that was the test shot. Now we're going to take our, our shot. Okay, so at this point we're going to switch over to manual mode. Okay, if, if we were previously in aperture priority. Okay. And as I mentioned, we've got all these things locked in already, so we're getting ready to take our shot. Um, next, step 10, we're going to add our ND filter if we are using an ND filter, okay? But when putting that ND filter on your camera, you want to be careful. Um, you want to make sure you don't uh, move the ca camera, bump the camera. If you're using the twist on uh, type of filter, you want to make sure that you don't accidentally uh, twist the focus ring on your lens and then throw off your focus, that sort of thing. Um, and just note that if you're using a, a very strong filter, like a 10 stop filter, you're not going to be able to see anything through your viewfinder or if you're in live view mode, okay? But you, again, the, the filter is like putting sunglasses on your lens, okay? But don't worry because you've already locked in your composition, you've already locked in your focus, okay? So we're just going to be utilizing a long shutter speed in order to get a properly exposed image, okay? Okay, so now we have the, the ND filter on, okay? Um, now we're going to calculate or apply our new shutter speed, okay? So I've given you um, kind of an example here, okay? So let's say our original shutter speed was 1 1 25th of a second, okay? And if we are utilizing a six stop uh, ND filter, uh, we're, we're gonna want to extend our shutter speed by six stops, okay? So I kind of put the shutter speed scale uh, down right here on the fifth bullet. So here's kind of our starting shutter speed, 1 1 25th. So again, if we're utilizing a six stop ND filter, we're gonna move six steps on the scale here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we're using an ND, six stop ND filter, our new shutter speed is going to be one half of a second, 
okay? And if we're utilizing a 10 stop filter, uh, we're gonna move 10 stops on the shutter speed scale, which puts, puts us at eight seconds, okay? And again, as I mentioned, if you're going to be needing a shutter speed that exceeds 30 seconds, uh, then you'll want to be utilizing your camera's bulb mode or time mode, whatever um, it's referred to um, as on your camera. And you'll be utilizing a remote shutter release to, to start the exposure and to end the exposure, okay? Okay, so now we're ready to take our shot, our long exposure shot. Okay, we take it, we take a look at the uh, image, we, we review it, we look at the histogram, make sure everything looks good, make sure the exposure looks good. Um, if things look off, perhaps slightly underexposed or overexposed, uh, then you just need to adjust your shutter speed accordingly, okay? Even though um, the filters might be rated at, at six stops or 10 stops, um, they might, it might not be perfect, okay? So you, you always have to let your eye be the judge, okay? So again, if something looks a little too dark, um, just extend the shutter speed a bit. If it looks overexposed, then reduce the shutter speed a bit, okay? Um, and just take some additional test shots and until you get to uh, an exposure that looks right to your eye. Um, on the topic of long exposure, I'm also going to mention uh, intentional camera movement or um, ICM as it's referred to. Okay, so with this type of photography, um, in many cases, we're gonna have the camera off the tripod, although you can do intentional camera movement with the camera on the tripod, okay? So what is ICM? It's a technique that lets you create stunning abstract images by moving your camera while capturing the shot, okay? Um, and you'll want to adjust your camera settings to acquire a correct exposure um, while using a longer shutter speed, right? So we're intentionally trying to capture motion or movement in our frame or in our shot. And I'm gonna show you some examples here in just a bit. Um, with this type of photography too, you might want to also consider uh, putting your camera in sh uh, shutter priority mode, okay? So if you, all, if you have kind of a, uh, a specific shutter speed in mind and you want to just kind of lock in that shutter speed to get consistent results, you might want to consider utilizing shutter priority mode uh, with this type of photography, okay? Um, so again, you're intentionally moving the camera to get kind of this weird or, you know, motion or this abstract effect, okay? These are examples of what you can do. You, you know, obviously you can do this handheld and you can move the camera in, in any manner. Uh, you can also pan, you can tilt, you can zoom in and out. Um, and then also I mentioned doing it on a tripod, you could try panning like from left to right or tilting, you know, up and down. And I'm gonna show you some examples here. Okay, so these are examples of panning while handheld, okay? I could have done this with a tripod um, and, and perhaps I, I might've gotten a better result, but these were done handheld. I don't think I have my tripod at the moment. These aren't, um, exceptionally long shutter speeds, but you see down here, this one was taken at 1 40th of a second, okay? And I'm just panning really quickly to the right. Because I have, um, you know, kind of this, um, you know, horizon line, um, you know, I'm just, that's how I'm moving the camera, okay? To kind of accentuate uh, those lines, okay? Those horizontal lines. This image here on the right was taken at 1 4th of a second, okay? And you'll see both of these, um, you know, I could have been using an ND filter, uh, but I was just trying to shoot more kind of on the fly at the moment. So I just closed down my aperture to F22 um, just to reduce the amount of light coming into the camera um, and to get, um, you know, the exposure I was looking for. Um, this is an example of, again, handheld, but moving the camera, uh, tilting it up and down, right? So in this particular image, it's kind of taken in this forest area. So I already have kind of these vertical lines going on in the scene, these trees, okay? So again, I'm trying to accentuate those vertical lines. So in this case, I decided to tilt the camera up and down, okay, to get, to get this effect, okay? You'll see this was taken at 1.3 seconds, okay? 
and another example of the same type of thing. So I'm tilting up and down, handheld. Um, I think you would get a better result or if you were trying to make these lines like straight, um, tilting on a tripod uh, might be a better uh, option for you. Uh, this one was taken at 0.3 seconds. And then a couple of examples here. This is a 0.5 second exposure. And with this one, um, I'm just, I have a zoom lens, a 70 to 40 millimeter lens. So I'm just zooming in and out. Okay. So um, I believe I was starting at 40, mil 40 millimeters and then uh, zooming out to 17 millimeters to get this effect. Um, and for this image on the right, I believe my exposure was about the same. Uh, but with this example, I'm actually turning the cam camera in a circular uh, manner to get this, this effect. Okay. So intentional camera movement. Okay. So again, we're, we're utilizing a longer shutter speed uh, to get these types of results. Okay. So conclusion, um, long exposure photography is a lot of fun. Um, and have fun with it. Break the rules. Don't be afraid to experiment. Um, you know, I talked about uh, taking test shots. Um, sometimes you might have to take multiple test shots to get the results you're looking for. Okay. But it's a great way to capture interesting and unique images. It's a great way to kind of um, you know, balance stillness or movement in your scene or to have blurry elements contrasting with sharp elements. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. It's really fun. Um, it does require a little more planning and a little more work compared to just regular photography, but I think the results uh, will be worth it. Um, also note that, you know, if you're utilizing a lot of long shutter speeds, it is going to drain your camera batteries quite a bit more. So be prepared, have backup batteries, that sort of thing. Okay. But that's it. Long exposure photography. Um, I hope this was helpful and I hope you have fun. Thank you again for listening.